feels like morning though because I just had a big, huge nap. And I'm going to tell you all about that story in just a second. It's the reason I wasn't streaming today. I know you don't care, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I'm the one talking. <laughs> it's great how that works. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm just setting some things up here. Let me go ahead and set the status. Status. So what I'm going to be doing is I, I want to... Uh, on Sundays, I want to do a couple things differently. Later on, I'm, if you're if you're wondering when when am I going to do the intro to Linux, uh, kind of walk work through. I'm going to be doing that later tonight. Um, but I I have sort of a little story to tell uh, about the last 24 hours, and uh, I think that will make a little bit more sense. Um, and so, but. But let me let me get there. I'm gonna go ahead and set this to set the status here. And uh, I don't know if anybody's gonna come in here on a Sunday night, so I'm just gonna I'll leave the chat open in case somebody does wander in. But if not, I'm not gonna sweat it. So suffice it to say, uh, and you guys, I mean, I, I don't I'm not gonna hide from any of you. I have I I stand by anything I do. Um, but I I had something of a Twitter fight. Not a fight uh, yesterday. Let's just say that I descended into madness uh, and actually went into Twitter a little bit because I was kind of trying to follow what was going on. Uh, I make a habit of following uh, people on my my other groups, you know, to kind of keep a track of what's going on. And and something came across my feed that was a a pretty disturbing, um, uh, you know, result. Uh, about the election, and I mean, nobody here knows that. I mean, I mean, everybody knows that I'm I, I'm like avidly against Trump. I think it's one of the worst things in our world. Uh, but I thought, okay, well, I'm I'm gonna try to enter into some dialogue and Twitter, and that was my first mistake. Suffice it to say, I ended up trying uh, to have a conversation. I ended up learning a bunch of things along the way, uh, which is really great. Um, uh, but more importantly, I um, found myself really depressed. In fact, so depressed, I, I, didn't, I couldn't sleep last night at all. And then I, later I fell asleep and, uh, I mean, I actually sincerely tried hard to have a dialogue with some people and to give them the benefit of the doubt and do all the things I talk about on the stream. And it just, it just fell apart. And, and I felt myself fall apart. I felt, you know, I just, I just, it just was horrible. And there was one person actually, thankfully that I was able to have a conversation with um, and if you really want to read that, you can, you know, go to my Twitter profile and read the tweets and replies. I'm not going to go into it with you right now. Um, but this was related to, um, like, oh God, this was insane. Um, so, so this was related to, uh, it ultimately became down a conversation about guns and, uh, and it was like, he's, we talked about this and here's the end of it actually. Uh, and I mean, if you really want to read my embarrassing tweets, you can go read them. But I hope you can see there that I really, really tried. And actually, I learned about a lot of United Nations resources about gun violence. And uh, I had my eyes opened on a number of things. For example, uh, it's an, a statistical fact, according to the United Nations, that uh, that United States is 104th in, in gun violence and not first. Uh, Brazil and Colombia has overwhelmingly higher numbers of homicide. And uh, I mean, just a bunch of things that I found out um, that, that because I gave people the benefit of the doubt and I went through and I read this is a, this is a completely different one. We don't even want to talk about that one. But um, and then I, I read it all and 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 then it, but it still devolved into the Well, that you're just like hiding in your little bubble, you know, and and, and you know, I, at least it was a higher level and it wasn't people. It wasn't like the detective who was was comparing Democrats to to KKK people and sending things, which turns out was true, by the way, the Democratic Party was more responsible for, um, uh, for, you know, the uh, white on black violence in the early days, and then the, the parties all switched around and stuff. So they're sort of, like, because I had to research that too. So this is how I am. I have to look at things and see what the opposite problems of them are. And, and I recently watched, you know, uh, the, um, what's it called? The, the, uh, Hunger Games movies, which I really love because they're really symbolic. Uh, there's no good or bad side in the end. It's it's all down to, you know, people and family and 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 you know, and that's what it. I want to get to the point where we like think about those things. So anyway, I I was really depressed. I spent the whole day cleaning and everything, and I woke up, 
and uh and uh i mean i after you know recently i just woke up and and then i found myself uh realizing that uh I, you know, I I had to do something. So, and, and it turns out that in the mail came this book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which I first heard about in Bill and Tell's Excellent Adventure, uh, Is It Too Deep or Dumb, which is fantastic. I really recommend you go watch that. Um, I can send you a link if you want, but you can just search it out. It's a really, really great Wisecrack. I really like Wisecrack in general. Wisecrack represents what I think is a potential part of our future uh they they just don't care they make sure to make great content no matter what and they're not bound to any particular uh, organization of course they're you know they have to bow down to youtube to be published and everything but other than that they're they're able to produce some really great content that's not hidden or tied to academia or anything like that anyway so so i thought i i got to those you know just thinking about this and this book also came at the same time and so, so here's Paulo Freire. Who is he, right? Well, he's this dude, this Brazilian educator and philosopher, Paulo Freire, who wrote Pedagogy of the Press in 1970. Uh, you know, definitely boomer generation. Hey, how's it going, Merton? And um, and he he uh, he, you know, he didn't his his ideas weren't necessarily unique, but for some reason, he gets really really credited for all these ideas. And so, I'm going to do something, and I, I suspect not a lot of you are going to want to stick around for this. Um, but I, and I don't know if I'm going to do this once a week or if I'm going to do, you know, how long I'm going to do it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing to you um, or if we're just going to have, if we're just going to be able to have um, some kind of like, you know, reference and we can do kind of a book club thing. Uh, but if anybody else would like to follow along, uh, the book, the book's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, I th I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it something like a, a Sunday book club. Um, I'm not promising the right time or anything like that, but if anybody wants to read this book with me, uh, I, I mean, you can come buy the book however you want to come buy the book. Um, again, it's called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, I thought seriously about potentially reading the book online and just doing it as kind of an audio book. It's a pretty short book. Um, and, uh, I may do that, uh, instead of what I might do is I might actually just, just summarize certain sections. I have that actual written book here. And, and so, you know, to stay true to my mantra, what if everybody did it? I don't, I don't think it, it's completely appropriate for me to create an audio book for something that, you know, should have an audio book, even though I don't agree with copyright law, I'm still, you know, going to try to recognize it. But uh, yeah, so here's the book. Um, there's the very first version. It's, it's had over a million copies sold. Uh, apparently, it's like really well known in the, um, you know, in the in the world of of education. It's something that somebody would probably read if they were getting a majors a master's in education. Uh, and so I just thought it'd be worth going into. But so I'm going to just jump right in. I'm going to read uh, the beginning of the introduction. Uh, this this vi this video. I don't know how long it'll be. Maybe an hour. Maybe less, uh, but it's designed to be something that's more something you could listen to as a podcast. Um, maybe you could just, you know, fire it up on your way to work or something like that. And I expect I'll be probably making a lot of content that way that doesn't really depend on on video of any way. Um, so it says here in the, the introduction is, is just really just describes how this was kind of an antidote to the vitriol and just filled with poison that I felt like after you know, eight hours on Twitter last night getting when I got totally sucked in for all the right reasons. But then it just turned into something that just I had to delete all a lot of it and and I'm not proud of it. And I just I'm just sad. I'm just sad that we had to go through that. And and I, you know, I've written a little bit about it. But so this is something of an antidote and I just want to share it. So introduction to the 50th uh, anniversary ed uh, edition from Donaldo Mas. I want to say Macedo or Macedo, University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, it is indeed an honor to write, about, uh, to write the introduction to Paulo, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, a book that is unquestionably a classic as it has throughout the last half century become increasingly more relevant as the, 20, as the 21st century ushers the world into a very dark age. Leading intellectuals such as Noam Chomsky, Zygmunt Bauman, Henry Giroux, uh, Ardid uh, Arudity Roy, Amy Goodman, Thomas Piketty, 
among others, have wisely and incessantly alerted people around the world of the dire consequences, i.e. denial of climate change, obscene economic inequality, and the potential for nuclear disaster catastrophe uh, of the far-right hegemony that, if left unchecked, may potentially result in the end of humanity as we know it. That sounds like really inflammatory, but I don't know. It sounds like a lot like where we are right now. Thus, not only must an alternative political course be taken, but central to the, to its agenda must be at the must be the development of a people's critical awareness of how they are in the world and with the world. And I've talked about this a lot. You know, the only answer to this is going to be, you know, if you want to save the world, you know, get into education. Nelson Mandela. You know, it's we have to help people f- know that they're in the world and that they're with the world, not just you know external to it. A posture that Freire insists upon, which upon and which informed his brilliant and insightful ideals in pedagogy of the press. That is to say, Freire's major goal in pedagogy of the press was not to propose an innovative methodology, I love this, which would be antithetical to his critical to his critique of formulaic models of education, he's a lot like me in that regard, but to launch the development of an emancipatory pedagogical process that invites and challenges students through critical literacies to learn how to negotiate the world in which they find themselves in a thoughtful and critical reflective manner so as to expose and engage the tensions and contradictions inherent in the ongoing relation between oppressor and oppressed. That is another way to say, to do kind of what Socrates did, teach him how to negotiate the world and study and learn and be an autodidactic kind of person and and then set them out to, you know, critical uh, thinking skills and to reflect upon them. Thus, the central goal of Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed is to awaken in the oppressed the knowledge, creativity, and constant critical reflective capacities necessary to unveil, demystify, and understand the power relations responsible for their oppressed marginalization and, through this recognition, begin to project begin a project of liberation through praxis which invariably requires consistent, never-ending critical reflection and action. Uh, work, be practical, do stuff. Currently, while more and more educators are embracing Freire. Many of them, I love this, including some liberal and progressives, allow their critical discourse to be to be betrayed by a lack of coherence between their denouncement of oppressive conditions and their accommodation to dominant structures that create these oppressive structures in the first place, a point at which I will return to later. Basically, our educational system, a bunch of hypocrites are claiming to be trying to help us out, and in truth, they're not doing anything but making it worse. Approximately a month or so before Paulo Freire's untimely death on May 2nd, 1997, he and I were walking on New York's Fifth Avenue discussing the obvious contradiction of New York's opulence that make it possible to, for people to flaunt their wealth, for instance, paying $27,000 for a chocolate sundae in luxurious restaurants amid thousands and thousands of homeless people, including families with children who sleep in cars, under bridges, and in overcrowded shelters. The unpacking of these contradictions was to be the major goal of a course that Freire and I contracted to co-teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in fall 1997, which is funny because, you know, he took the Harvard money and taught it himself. I know he probably lived the, lived the talk more, but still, you know, he was a part of the system. That's how come he got published. Uh, we had we had agreed that we would invite students into a critical dialogue about bodies of knowledge not usually emphasized in the academic and in the ac- academy such as ethics, the sub the substantivity of democracy beyond the four year, uh, four year of the carnivalesque voting cycle as we have recently witnessed with Donald Trump's successful campaign for the presidency. I guess this was written. This introduction was written recently and a rigorous study of ideology and its role in reading the word and the world. During our walk along Fifth Avenue, Freire would frequently ask me if we could stop so he could be more, he could take a more empathetic, uh, make his points and share his concerns regarding the destructive and oppressive force of neoliberalism uh, in developed and developing countries. And this is, this is another reason why I like Hunger Games so much. Uh, the Hunger Games movies, I, don't, I haven't read the books, but the Hunger Games movies really represent what happens when you have both sides of bad and you're stuck in the middle. When you have neoliberalism that's, that's going to end up turning into like, you know, like a Maoist regime, uh, just like we've had in the French Revolution and we had in the, in the, the Russian revolutions. 
you know, it, and when the revolution consumes itself and becomes a new, a new ty- a tyrannical form of oppression, uh, to, that just replaces the old one. And this is something that, you know, we're at danger of right now. And the bad part about it is that it's actually being flamed by the fight that's happening between the extreme edges of our politics right now. So you can't talk about education without talking about politics because that's the whole point. Um, let me continue here. So, uh, okay. Frequently he would lean against the wall of these imposing buildings to avoid the usual frantic torrents. Uh, Hey Haney, cock the law. Uh, um, Frequently, he would lean against the wall of imposing buildings to avoid the usual frantic torrent of hurried people who, in a dizzying way, wanted to forge ahead uh, of the other pedestrians. Those, perhaps, who on occasion may have slowed down to a bit of, to satisfy their consumerist curiosity and an unending and seductive store window displays of fashion and the latest technological gadgets, a, hall, a hallmark of an obsessive consumerist society, a society where, quote, money is the measure of all things and profit the primary goal. For the oppressors, what is worthwhile is to have more, always more, even at the cost of the oppressed, having less and having nothing. For them, to be is to have, page 58. In retrospect, I now realize that Freire's frequent request to stop had more to do with the fatigue he was experiencing due to his heart condition, an ailment that he made that he kept very much to himself about which and he seldom complained. While Freire's uh, always always remain true to his view of history as possible as possibility and maintain an unflinching hope that a less discriminatory, more just, more less dehumanizing and more humane world is possible. He was always critical of the libertarian propaganda that merely quote implant in the oppressed, a belief in freedom, thus thinking to win their trust. Accordingly, Freire believed that quote, the correct method lies in dialogue I, I'm that's getting underlined right now. I had it kind of wanted to do that before, but I was in the tub. <laughs> I was reading this in the tub. Yes. Um, a process that unveils the conviction of the oppressed that they must fight for their liberation, which is not a gift bestowed by the revolutionary leadership. Again, my hunger games thing comes to me, but the result of their own Conscienciazo. <laughs> During this long and engaging walk, Freire shared with me, semi jokingly, that the ruling quote, the ruling class will never send us to Copacabana for a, voca- for a vacation. If we want to go to Copacabana, we have to fight for it. In this last walk and dialogue with Freire, he would often reveal his frustration that, at times, bordered on, quote, just ire. And I love that word because it's. It's, it, it captures what I felt yesterday when I kind of get angry and I start to rage. Uh, as he would often say, relative to the accommodation of some turncoat progressives to neoliberal theology. And this, this is so important. People think that I'm a liberal or progressive and they'd love to try to peg me, but this is, this is what it is. Such was the case of his friend, the former president of Brazil, Fernando Henriquez, who, like Freire, uh, had been... Uh, exiled to Chile by Brazil's brutal neo-Nazi military dictatorship that killed and tortured thousands of Brazilians. In fact, Brazil's experimentation with neoliberalism under the government of Fernando Henriquez uh, exacerbated already uh, cruel conditions and sentenced millions of Brazilians to hunger, human misery, and despair, which in turn contributed to the widening of the economic and educational inequality gap while unleashing more systematic government corruption. Sadly, most socialist governments in the Western world of the time of that time betrayed their commitment to social justice, equality, and, and equity by veering toward a neoliberal mark crazed ideology, which not only crushed the hope that people who aspire for a better world, but also brought down the governments by enabling obscene corruption, as was the case in Portugal, Spain, and Greece. In the latter country, the Socialist Party, led by Prime Minister George Papandreou, uh, allowed corruption to reach epidemic proportions to the point where, for example, the PASOK would buy votes to offer free airfare tickets to Greek citizens living in the United States who were willing to fly to Greece with the promise of voting for the socialists. Such acts smack of tactics that Western democracies routinely criticize as fraudulent election rigging, rigging they say plague these countries pejoratively termed third world banana republics. To a degree, socialist governments in multiple continents fell from power due to obscene scandals of corruption, which, in general, gave rise to center-right and far-right governments. Greece is an exception where the radical left party won the election. 
uh, that have now been elected by dissatisfied and disenfranchised voters, voters who became victims of the austerity measures imposed by neoliberal policies. Um, and Freire, Freire, this, I'm almost done with this. So Freire, Freire also did not hesitate uh, to demonstrate his just ire by denouncing his critical posture of many facile liberals and some so-called critical educators, this is my favorite, who often find refuge in the academy by hiding their addiction to obscene consumerism, while at the same time attacking in their written criti- critical discourses the market theology of neoliberalism. Too often these facile liberals and their so-called critical educators' tastes and ways of being in the world and with the world remain, according to Freire, wedded to the very ne- neoliberal market solutions that they denounce at the very level of written critical discourse. In their day-to-day practices, these facile liberals and so-called critical educators often betray the action required by praxis by fossilizing their purported political project into an obscure, discursive criticality that begs to move beyond the ways, quote, postponed arrival of action, that is, action designed to transform the current pernicious of the neoliberal godification of the market into new democratic structures that lead to equality, equity, and a th- authentic democratic processes. In other words, many facile liberals and so-called critical educators bored boast of their leftist credentials by wearing presumed Marxism on their sleeve, usually only expressed in written discourse for the safety or in the safety of academia, and sometimes feel the urge to foster to further boast that, for example, their radicalism is beyond Marx proposals to the degree that they are authentically more Maoist in their political orientation, a posture they believe to be even more radical and popular with their peers. But meanwhile, they're being like, you know, radical capitalists. As a consequence, leftist labels in the academy become an appropriate, ex- ex- exoticized political and cultural currency where to be a Marxist in residence in the ivory tower bestows status, but is little more than a chic brand. In reality, the epitome of consumerism sustained by transactions occurring in a merely symbolic register of names and labels that are otherwise vacuous in substance. In essence, the ac- the academy the academic branding of marxist by some critical educators turns ethical and political action into a spectacle and leftist viewpoints into de facto commodities as commodities these self-ascribed quote radical positions and labels are emptied out of their progressive content to the extent that they are decoupled from principled action a decoupling that remains fundamental in the reproduction of the market theology of neoliberalism where collective social engagement based on critical thinking is discouraged and zealous cutthroat competition is rewarded. This insidious process of decoupling critical discourse and action legitimizes not, quote, walking the talk. It affords the proclaimed Marxist in residence the opportunity, for, for instance, to claim to be anti-racist while turning anti-racism into a lifeless cliché that does not provide pedagogical spaces for critique of white supremacist ideologies. In this process, their progressive stances are often co-opted, mobilized only to the degree that they denounce racism at the level of that written critical discourse, all the while reaping privileges from the cemented institutional racism which they willfully refuse to acknowledge and engage in action to dismantle. In other words, they talk, they make money about it, they tweet about it, they check in at different protests but don't show up, take the paychecks, write the books, and look the other way. Hence, these Marxist and residents also ignore the political and systematic impact of racism that was amply witnessed in the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign and which became more frightening with each calculated pronouncement by Donald Trump used to ignite white rage against people rather than against the state for conditions caused in large part by the neoliberal policies that the enraged white working class ironically embraced. This is exactly what's happening. I, had, I didn't know about this part. I haven't read this part yet. The election of Trump as a president and the potential re-election of Trump as president, in essence, unveiled the lie behind the post-race slogan which proclaimed that, quote, racism is over, a slogan that took shape with the election of Barack Obama, the first black president. Furthermore, the very failure to acknowledge the, rav- the ravages of racism while enlarging ghettos, normalizing the school and prison pipeline, making it mostly of, of blacks and Latinas, or expanding human misery by a, as a byproduct of racism constitutes in itself a racist act. It is racism when the proclaimed Marxist and Maoist and residents proselytize against racism as an abstract idea and resist the intellectual and societal pressure to translate this abstract idea at a level of written critical discourse into action that would, ra- that would racially democratize society and its institutions. 
how racially democratic are, for example, the universities when most departments remain practically all white, less for token professors of color, and a minuscule number of non-white students? For instance, does race play a role in almost non-existence of African Americans in classics departments, both at the faculty and student levels, or, or, or is it the case that the African Americans are gen genetically wired to have no vocation toward the study of classics and are consequently averse to classical studies? More pernicious yet is, is when these self-proclaimed leftists and residents engage in the social construction of not seeing the ingrained racism in their statements and in their behavior. For, for example, take the case of a proclamation made by a liberal white professor working in an urban university that prides himself on his diversity. Quote, we just want these black kids to learn how to learn. Such a remark would not, po would not only point, such a remark not only points to a, a, rigid, to a rigidly ethnocentric notion of the act of knowing as insightful argument by Freire and pedagogy of the oppressed, but it also shows that individuals making such statements remain shackled by white supremacist ideology that has inculcated them in the myths and beliefs that children from certain races and cultures are innately incapable of learning until they receive their recipes taught to the poor and the oppressed by educators who often carry in their leather Gucci bags and briefcases these prepackaged lessons plans to teach, for example, African Americans what they cannot already know because they have never had the capacity to acquire knowledge until then. The very survival of the cruel conditions in which these, these non-white child children have been condemned to live, very lived there, lived in Brazil. So, uh, you know, lived, it demonstrates that they know very well how to learn in order to stay alive in, cir in circumstances of, quote, savage inequalities, as poignantly described by Jonathan Cazal in several of his books. Would the daughters and sons of these Marxist and resident educators survive the ravages of such entrenched social inequalities and remain unscathed while excelling in the required high-stakes testing? Probably not. Hence, the very survival from the most horrendous forms of racism, segregation, gender, and class disc discrimination not only point to a high level of intelligence of children who are ghetto ghettoized, but who would add credence to Howard Gardner's notion of multiple intelligence beyond the Western-centric notions of, quote, intelligence. The just ire... Uh, the just ire that Ferry demonstrates in his last dialogue with me when he denounced some critical educators who inhibit, who inhabit, quote, silk underwear was in turn channeled by him as a creative force toward the end of his life, both in his writings and exemplified by his last book, Pedagogy of Freedom, and in the many latter, and in the many latter dialogues and lectures throughout the world. Very correctly opposed the pseudo-critical educator whose political project of social justice is betrayed by intellectual incoherence and a, and a crass careerism fueled by what Ferrari often called the, quote, ethics of the market under neoliberalism. In other words, the intellectual incoherence of many critical educators ultimately defines and, confer, conf, defines and confines their political project into, into mere neo, neoliberal crass careerism. However, it is important to point out that Freire's disgust with the crash careerists does not mean that he was against the, the pursuit of a career. There is a marked difference between having a career that is not instrumentalist and in which is situated within a political project that strives for the world that, as Freire would often say, is more round, less unjust, and more democratic, and a careerist whose political project is his or her own individual advancement, marked by sophistry and obscene greed, which almost always sacrifice equity, equality, and authentic democracy. And, you know, that is to say, the careerist political educator who is ultimately his or her, his or her own career is all, and to save his or her own career, the crash careerist will, quote, fail to initiate or will abandon dialogue, reflection, and communication, and will fall into using slogans, communiques, monologues, and instructions. Superficial uh, conversions to the cause of, liber of liberation carry this danger. The danger lies, for example, in the disarticulation of writing about hunger within the confines and safety of the, aca of the academy and the actual experience of hunger, or in making the sloganized proclamation, quote, I am a Maoist, while refusing to, to de gucci and allow oneself to remain shackled to bourgeois values that undergrid much of the neoliberal project and which deem the, the appropriation and accumulation of things as more important than an expansion of humanity. As Freire insightfully argue, I mean, look at the, look at the guys, look at the, how much it costs to go to school these days. Look at how much it costs to go to school these days. I mean, it's, it's insane. It costs you to, how much, how, why does it cost so much money? You know why? Because it's, it's turned into a capitalist for, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's the worst thing of all. It's like, it's like academic education has become this, like, this, like, you know, gussied up lipstick on the pig kind of shit that that 
people buy into because they have to because the capitalists or the people who own the money that's not, not even capitalists it's people who can you know control the system make the rules and the people who go into it and then they they have tenure they're totally protected can say whatever the fuck they want make massive amounts of money and then you know spout all kinds of things that they don't ever actually have to put into practice uh, it's just a label for the corrupt elite, but neoliberalism is what has broken down society since the 70s and 80s. And by the way, I am not against uh, this. I'm not. Look, don't try to categorize me based on reading this. Okay, I'm just taking one idea at a time, and I believe that that's how we should do everything. You know, and there's no. I don't no I don't want any fucking label defining me, and I don't think you should either. We should find what this means, but we have to use words to 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 say that. And one of them um, is neoliberalism. So what's happening is the neoliberalism, it sounds to me like the neoliberalism is fanning the fa flames of the far right because the far right is seeing the neoliberalism is going and, and they're judging everybody based on that. And they're throwing all progressive ideas and ideologies out the window because that's what they think it is. And then, and then you get, you know, you get Antifa and you get things like that or even more. So, and, and I'm not, look, you know, I'm, uh, but there obviously are lots of raw problems with the far right as well. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not as easy to just say right and left, red and blue. That's not what's going on here, people. Accordingly, well, one, this is about education, believe it or not. I know you don't think so, but... <laughs> so, uh, I uh, had a different flight than politicians who started neoliberalism po politics. Probably true, Peter. I don't know. So, uh, accordingly, while no one believes... Uh, while no, no one liberates herself or himself by, by her or his own efforts alone... Neither is she or he liberated by others. Hmm. Liberation, a human phenomenon, cannot be achieved by semi-humans. I wonder what he means by that. And this isn't Freire. This is the introduction, by the way. Any attempts to treat people as semi-humans, this is the case with white supremacy and patriarchy, um, uh, only dehumanizes them. A semi-human whose only concern is things and not people can never nor is he or she willing to offer a form of literacy that leads to liberation and emancipation. Quite to the contrary, a semi-human who pursues the process of, quote, othering human beings so as to devalue and typecast them has already lost his or her humanity to the extent that he or she cannot see humanity in others. That is getting underlined. Where's my underline? This is exactly what happened, and this is what I experienced last night on Twitter. Quite to the contrary, a semi-human who pursues the process of othering human beings so as to devalue and typecast them has already lost his or her humanity to the extent that he or she cannot see humanity in others. Well, it looks like economic output, anything that has value which cannot be expressed monetarily is not a value uh, for neoliberal politicians. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, anything that has value, which cannot be expressed monetarily, is not a value uh, for neoliberal politicians. Yeah. For Ferrari, literacy was not, this is, according, um, this is something else here. Uh, I got another quote. It's, just, it's a block quote here. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep going. I'm just really inter enjoying this. I just thought I'd share it. Not everybody's going to enjoy it, but... Um, for Freire, literacy was not a means to prepare students for the world of subordinate labor or, quote, careers. I'm totally on board with this, I can already tell. But a preparation for a self-managed life. Holy shit, Freire. People ask me all the time, what, what kind of grade am I get? What certificate am I going to get? What what's my kid going to get? I'm like, education, learning, empowerment. Um, say, hey, guys. Uh, Bukare, ça va? And, but preparation, uh, and self managed and self management could only occur when people have fulfilled three categories of education, three goals of education. Oh my god, this is so good. Et ben, pas mal. Je lis un petit peu un livre de Paulo Freire. Uh, C'est au sujet de pédagogie uh, de l'oppressé, enfin, comment ça se dit, oppressed. Je lis pas. So and and self managed and self managed could only occur when people have fulfilled three goals of education. People have occurred, not teachers. Self reflection. That is, realizing the famous poetic phrase, 
Know thyself. I actually have, I actually have, oppression. I actually have a, a, a module on know thyself. I have a process where I say you can't do any education until you know thyself. What Linux should I learn? What career should I get? What things should I, what do you like to do? If you don't know thyself, you cannot continue to do education. Qu'est-ce que tu fais aujourd'hui? Moi, je lis un petit peu. Um, je raconte des histoires. En fait, enfin, c'est pas une histoire, mais je lis un peu, je lis un petit peu et je raconte des histoires. C'est tout. Reflection that that is realizing the payment. No, this off. Which is in which which is an understanding of the world in which they live, in its economic, political, and equally important, its psychological dimensions. Specifically, critical. Pedagogy helps the learner become aware of the forces that have hitherto ruled their lives and especially shaped their consciousness. Huh. Okay, so let's see. So the first goal is self-reflection. That is, know thyself. And let's see. The third goal is to help set the conditions for producing a new life. That is the goal of education. Setting the conditions for producing a new life. Oh, wow. <laughs> a new set of arrangements where power has been, at least in tendency, transferred to those who literally make the social world by transforming nature and themselves. You want to change the world, people. Help people learn true education, true knowledge, true um, autodidactic learning, knowing themselves, and then what? Understanding the world in which they live, knowing themselves, knowing the world, and helping them set the, their own conditions for a new life. That is education. Do they do that in school? Sometimes. Because Ferrari was often criticized for not critically addressing issues of race relations and pedagogy of the press, one of his major goals in the course uh, that we are going to co-teach at Harvard, that we were going to co-teach at Harvard Graduate School in 1997, was to expand our dialogue titled "A Dialogue: Culture, Language, and Race," which has been published in a Harvard Education Review. In this dialogue, life experiences like dropping. Yes, I agree. I think that's what education means, and that's what I think it should mean. That's why I don't like the verb to teach because it's a transitive verb. There's no transitive tr process going on. Sometimes there is if you're if it's like a mentor and a mentee. You know, there's demonstrations, but mostly it's a it's to learn, which is you know an intransitive verb. Um. Anyway, Barry is just so explaining why cross and brushes preoccupate him. Instead of them having equivalent education as my bachelor's degree, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and boy, I, I know so many of them. I, there's one of them in my community right now who shall, know, name, who shall be unnamed who hasn't got even a high school degree. And he is amazing on so many levels. You can tell that I think I actually think it's 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 I, I think when you don't get a, a formal education, if you are if you have learned to learn and if you have a hunger for learning, which hasn't been beaten out of you by traditional academic uh, institutions, then you tend to do better. Because you never know that you don't know enough. So there's nobody telling you, oh, you did everything. You know, and these, these people exist. And you know what? We, if we could help make more of those people, if we can help. And that's what, that's what I feel like this book is about. It's like helping people pull themselves out of oppression by, by these, these methods. You know? And it doesn't mean paying $20,000 a year to go to college. For some people, it might mean that. But for most, it's not going to mean that. My brother who dropped out in eighth grade and drives a truck worth, yeah, a year working easily, barely doing anything. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. And there's a part of me that really likes to drive. I think I would be fine to drive a truck because I would just listen to audiobooks and just think. <laughs> I'd get fat too, but I, that's what I would do. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Given a historical context that shared oppression in Brazil, an oppressive, an oppression experienced by Freire and his family who lost their middle class status and had to move from the city and live in the poor lower class area near Morodis. That sounds like me. 
<laughs> I feel like I'm starting life all over again. I'm living in this tiny little apartment. You know, I I have lived the opulent, you know, the life of a khakis wearing corporate employee and you know i don't miss it um we literally did an essay on this freshman year of college how funny melamoxie hey welcome uh that's good to hear actually um especially in freshman year because that probably set the stage for some of your thinking to come after that an in-law family member with dyslexia but is a smart guy yeah um Ferry's denunciation of oppression did not constitute a mere intellectual exercise that we often find among many facile liberals and pseudo-critical educators. Amen! His intellectual brilliance and courage in denouncing the structures of oppression were rooted in a very real and material experience. He did it, dudes. As he recounts his childhood and adolescent years living in poverty in Moro de Basaude, the experience of hunger as a child of a formerly middle-class family that had lost its economic base enabled Freire to, on the one hand, identify and develop, quote, solidarity with the children from the poor outskirts of town, end quote, and, on the other hand, to realize that, quote, in spite of the hunger that gave us solidarity, in spite of the bond that united us in our search for ways to survive, our playtime, as far as the poor children were concerned, ranked us as people from another world who happened to fall accidentally into their world, end quote. It is the realization of such class borders that led invariably to Freire's radical rejection and denunciation of a class-based society. Hi, off the man. Although some strands of postmodernism would dismiss Freire's detailed class analysis and pedagogy of the press, it is an enormous mistake, if not academic dishonesty, to pretend that we now live in a classless world. Although Freire understood very well the, quote, material oppression and the effective instruments that tie oppressed groups to the logic of denom domination cannot be grasped in all of their complexity without a singular logic of class struggle, quote, he consistently argued that a thorough understanding of oppression must always take a detour through some form of class analysis. At the same time, a postmodern posture uh that over-celebrates identity politics not only leads to essentialism, but also contains within itself seeds of oppression. Boy, that is Twitter if I've ever seen it right there. You know, being offended and being too easily offended. You know what I'm saying? Being offended and being too easily offended. Let's see. At the same time, a postmodern posture that over-celebrates identity politics not only leads to essentialism, but also contains within it seeds of oppression. Yeah, damn. Take, for example, the progressive Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren <laughs> claimed to be an American Indian, even though she was a many gesture. This is not, this is not written by, it's probably written, not a Republican, but it's interesting. Take uh, Elizabeth Warren's claim to be an American Indian, even though she had many generations removed from America. She actually did that, by the way. And I love Warren. I love, love, love her. But she did that. Just like, just like, uh, uh, just like Biden was, was, was canned. His freshman year had to retake his school because he, they found that he had plagiarized. This is facts, people. I am not trying to s promote Trump. Trump is the evil devil in this scenario. But everybody has something wrong with them. So so I can read this thing about Warren and be okay saying it. You know, uh, Obama uh, drank water at, at Flint, Michigan and said, what's the big deal? And I mean, you know, they're, they're, every politician has a problem. They all have problems. The problem is, you know, in our current instance, how can you stay alive? It's very, it's very Hunger Games, right? Um, yeah, we're talking politics and we're talking, particularly we're reading about the pedagogy of the oppressed of Paula Freire, which is about education, which invariably leads to politics. Um, and, you know, if you guys can remain polite, and uh, then I'm wel welcome to have you here. But I, 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 I like, um, yeah, politics in relation to education. I, this is the thing. I, I don't want to run away from discourse and dialogue. I want to get away from the Twitter, you know, kill each other forums. But if our species... God, I almost want to cry. You know, if we don't figure out how to dialogue about these things respectfully, we're fucking done. We're done. Our time on the earth is over. 
we've got to figure this out. That means we can't shun away from it, but we also don't go blazing into it with, you know, we don't, we don't take guns to Kent state. It does to protest our, you know, Oh God, it, it, it is. It's just so it, it is. It's not just Twitter. It's everywhere. It's the anonymity. The anonymity and, and all the stress that's going on has just thrown us out of our humanity. We don't, we don't look at each other as human beings at all anymore. And in and, and the, and the past, historically, the only way we end up doing that is by having some massive, almost world-destroying event. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, fuck. You know, we don't really learn anything. Um, Senator, I'm going to read this, but I don't want anybody to think that my reading this means that I am in one political camp or another. Senator Warren's opportunistic use of the race card to make herself more attractive as a candidate for a professional position at Harvard Law School, which she actually did at Harvard University, use of her employment as proof of its commitment to diversity, it's a very boomer thing to do, by the way, only demonstrates how dominant institutions rely on tokenism to reinforce their exclusionary politics do not welcome the presence of any non-white groups in our institutions other than as a token representative. I don't, God, this guy, is, he's a little bit off the rails. This is, I'm reading him. He's saying some things I don't agree with here, but that's fine. I'll read it anyway. In reality, the opportunity to use of race and gender cards defang the very spirit of the Civil Rights Act. Eh, kind of, I don't know. It also provides segregationists and those beholden to patriarchy and white supremacy with ammunition to dismiss and criticize the anti-discriminatory laws that discourage exclusion on the basis of race or gender. I mean, that's a big, thorny topic. Under under his death, until his death, very courageously denounced the neoliberal position that promotes the false notion of the end of history and the end of class. In contrast to the idea that society has reached the end of its of its evolution, thus emptying history of its meaning, Freire always viewed historical awareness as an ongoing condition for human betterment. Uh, I agree. Openly opening up the possibility for a better future when, quote, recognizing that history is t- is time filled with possibility and not inexor- exec- eh, inexorably determined. That the future is problematic and not already decided fatalistically. Thank God. Let's hope. In like manner, Ferry continued to reject any false claim to the to the end of class struggle. Whereas he continually revised his earlier class analysis, he never abandoned or devalued class. This is another thing. Can we please let people progress and change? Uh, yeah, I'm reading Pedag- Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I can't put it on the screen. It would be a copyright violation. Um, so I'm reading the introduction of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But we got to let people change their minds. You know, we can't we can't judge people on things that they said or did 75 years ago. That goes for Trump. We have to judge people on who they are and what they believe today. But it definitely goes for Biden, Trump, and any other human. You know, most of our presidents, including Reagan and Obama, were anti-gay marriage, and they changed their position, not because of politics, but because they had new information. That includes me. You know, when I was Mormon, I believed that that uh, gender attraction was uh, a physical thing. I didn't understand the complexities of the brain with regard to that. And I've since did a lot of self-study and research and uh, study of the animal kingdom. Uh, I, have a, I have a medical friend who studied the seven, the seven different genders, the seven different possible combinations of, of chromosomes that, that exhibit themselves in a natural world. And all these many, many other things which, which opened my perspective and made me able to, to change my position. If somebody were to, to read back to me my words from blog posts in 1997 or 98, I'd say that I'm not the same human being. We have to let people grow and progress and change, and we have to take them for who they are now. We can't. We can't. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. We have to stop throwing people's, you know, stuff in their face. Or from January, <laughs> yeah. No kidding, man. I've changed totally from January, Raritan, on certain things. On certain things, yeah. God, I've changed so much just being on the live stream. I mean, it, yeah, Raritan was here when I was earlier on the live stream, and there's still many things I believe that are the same, but I think it's important that we allow ourselves to adapt and grow. I know, but it's totally true. It's totally true. There's been really strong positions I had with regard to certain technologies in January that have changed radically in just six months. So if you don't change, you don't learn. 
And, and you know, this, the thing is, though, is that we got to let other people change, too. Do you know what I mean? We can't roast them for having a position that they don't even like anymore. You know, because it's hard to say, a lot of people don't have it in them to say, I was wrong. And those people still deserve respect, too. We need to, I, it's hard to be around those kind of people. You know what I'm talking about. But anyway, let me keep reading here. This is good for me. While uh, post-structuralists may want to proclaim the end of class analysis, they still have an account to account for the horrendous human conditions that led, as Rary recounted, a family in northeast Brazil to scavenge for food in a landfill and take, quote, pieces of an amputated human breast with which they prepared their Sunday lunch. Even though I experienced the great good fortune of working with Paulo for 16 uninterrupted years, first translating many of his books into English and later collaborating with him on many other book projects, and I have read and reread Pedagogy of the Oppressed so many times, with each rereading of the book, I gain new insights uh, in my understanding of the current world, a world that is plagued by manufactured wars, expanding human misery and obscene greed. Without falling into false modesty, I have always felt I understood Freire's leading, leading ideas and subtleties and the nuances that characterize the, peg, the pedagogy of the oppressed, but I did not really fully capture the layered complexity of Freire's philosophy until I visited Moro de Saude, an impoverished community on the outskirts of Recife in northeast Brazil. As mentioned earlier, uh, Freire and his family had moved there after a great economic crash in the 1930s that unceremoniously yanked the middle-class rug out from under Freire's family. No longer able to afford housing, as the economic situation wor worsened, Freire's family moved to a modest house in Moray de Saudi, where Paulo, his siblings, his parents, and other close family members took refuge. I immediately began to see new dimensions and the raison d'etre of pedagogy of the press. As I entered the modest house in a dark small room without an indoor bathroom and with non-existent ceilings, I began to put into perspective the traumas that must have overwhelmed Freire as he came to face to face with the new form of schooling called life. Life created and sustained by a cruel system that uncaringly relegated millions and millions of Brazilians to half-citizenry and subhumanity. I also took a short walk around a shrinking river where Freire and his friends used to take baths alongside the neighborhood women who would re religiously wash clothes on a daily basis. The sun was the only towel available to Freire to dry his skin. Uh, are you from Brazil? In Paulo Freire, yeah. I see the bad thing that slows down people's education. A socialist communist, uh, yeah. I say that is a socialist communist, all that is bad, yeah. Bye. See you, Bart Bacari. A plus. Very learn quickly that the psychological classes, the, the, you know, there's so many people who won't even listen to this dude because he lived in Brazil. I, I'm not kidding. There, there, there are so many Americans who would just dismiss this dude, just like they dismissed me because I wrote Russian in my title on Twitter. That's the world we live in. And I have to focus on the good. I have to do that thing that the Mockingjay does in the last scene. Focus on the good. Yeah, I I know it's late here too. Um, I'm I'm about done myself. I I just wanted to kind of read this and and throw it out there to the world. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading this book. Um, this is a book written by a guy who was raised in abject poverty. So you know these kind of people really look. Even if he's speaking at Harvard, I can forgive him for that, right? It's like there are people who have have been there. And they're not just talking about it. And that's what the, the introduction guy, what's his name? I should probably say it. Uh, Donaldo Ma Macedo, University of Massachusetts. I don't know this dude. Sounds, he sounds, he sounds like he's got some strong opinions. Very, very nice guy, it sounds like. But uh, he, he, it sounds like he's a little bit more, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to find a color for him. He's actually got, I, I wouldn't say libertarian even. But anyway, very learned quickly that the, psycho the, the psychological class wall enveloped his new reality as he began to get acquainted with his new friends and neighbors. Their humanity enabled him to empathize with his aunt, preoccupation with keeping their poverty hidden, and to understand, quote, why the family would not let go of, of Lorde's German piano or his father's neckties, end quote. Even when his father was doing manual chores in the workshop, but Freire soon learned that his family's clinging to middle-class markers and mores did little to alleviate their pain. 
The pain almost always treated with disrespectful language as his mother, as his mother, who would be denied groceries on credit since the family was never able to pay, would leave the shop to look at it to look for another one where new offenses were almost always added to these already suffered. In an effort to protect his mother from such daily blows to her dignity, Freire would often wander into the backyard of neighbors to steal chickens. That would frequently be the one day's one family meal. Since, by then, all of the other town's merchants had refused to grant his family credit. You know, I just want to say something, too, here. People, um, yeah, everything to the rich, fuck the poor. Um, yeah, this is like, that. people don't care until they feel it. At Harvard is like false advocates publishing videos on YouTube. It's where the audience is. You know what? I think I think you might be right. Yeah, <laughs> I think you might, I think you might be right. Yeah, that's a really good comparison, Peter. I really love that. Yeah, I have to use you know I, I have to use YouTube. I have to use Google, which is YouTube, to do things. Right? That's where the market is. That's where the the audience is. That's why you have you have to publish academic paper because they're not going to get heard. But it's, to a certain extent, that's like bowing down to the organization. But this is why I want to make the knowledge net because I really want to build something where people can can exchange uh, knowledge without being married to a particular platform or centralized server. Um, yeah. My point is, is that people don't care until it hits them. I'd go so far as a philosophical thing, but I, I'd go so far as to say is that people, you know, people really, really don't care about other people. And they what they care about is themselves, and the only way you can get them to feel empathy is to get them to hurt, and then they can empathize with the people who are hurting. And, and I know that's an, an extreme position, but I see it over and over again. I see you know blazing red Republicans flip on gay marriage and and, and gender issues and homosexuality overnight because they found out their kid has it. Or, or they become AIDS advocates, or, or they, they say, I was totally wrong on COVID. I don't, how many times have we seen this? People who, we now, again, let me just repeat what I said. If that's what it takes to have people change their position, so be it. We need to let them change. I'm not wishing it on anyone, but we need to allow people to change. Even people that, you know, hate might have come into your heart a little bit, because we need to allow people to change. Otherwise, we can't have change. We can't punish them and say, "No, I saw your ten tweets that said this and that, and 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 you voted on on you voted against you know this and that this many times, and you're clearly this is your record. You're not a real person." And and he said, "Okay, well, what have, what have you done lately? You know, you do to, to some degree. You have to balance what they've. You can't just believe them by their words and then have them lie and keep doing what they always do. So it's a tough it's a tough thing to be human, man." To protect his family's middle class sensitivities, Fru would euphemize his backyard threats, his backyard thefts, uh, as incursions into a neighbor's yard. <laughs> Freire's mother was a Christian Catholic who no doubt viewed such incursions as violations of her moral principles, but she must have realized that, quote, her alternatives were either to reproach Freire severely and make him return to his still warm chicken dick and to, to return the chicken dinner to their neighbors or to prepare the fowl as a special dinner. <laughs> Uh, her common sense prevailed, still silent. She took the chicken, walked across the patio, patio, entered the kitchen, and lost herself in doing a job she had not done in a long time. Freire's mother knew that stealing a neighbor's chicken was morally wrong and constituted a crime, but she also knew that there was a priori crime committed by society, the manufacturing of hunger. This is a tough one, though, because I've heard people use a priori things like that to say, hey, I'm going to shoplift. Who gives a shit? The society doesn't care about me. Uh, there are bad people in all of our societies, a few good people. Well, what what does bad and good mean, right? That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, and you, you make a huge difference. It gives you hopes that there is some good in humans too. I completely agree. I have to focus on those people, the people that I know that I've met through live streaming, which is something of a desperate outcry to meet new people who care uh, by me because I, I'm i just inundated with 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 people who are, you know, just not and and their priorities wrong. I mean, some have gone so far to to attack me uh, for being this or that, and and because of my life choices, which put me where I am right now. And and I just I just like you know you just do not understand me. And then I read about Freire, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy gets it. 
Today I met a lady who adopted two dogs, two dogs, one blind and one deaf, to give them a good life. See that? Isn't that amazing? There are people out there like that. I suspect that people don't get born as bad people. Most of it is how they're raised. I that's the nature versus nurture thing, and that's a real philosophical rab, rabbit hole. It's a really fun one. Um, but yeah, the whole Skinner versus whatever, right? Um, being good, caring about others without self-interest, playing a role, caring about the environment. Yeah, I, I want to believe it that empathy exists, um, but we're not seeing much of it right now. Uh, as Freire recounted, the problem of hunger created by social inequality was real and concrete hunger that had no specific date or departure. Uh, on the contrary, our hunger was the type that arrives unannounced and unauthorized, making itself a home without end in sight. A hunger that, if it was not softened as ours was, would take over our bodies, molding them into angular shapes. Legs, arms, and fingers becoming skinny, eye sockets becoming deep inner, deeper, making the eyes almost disappear. Many of our classmates experience this level of hunger, and today it continues uh, as it inflicts millions of Brazilians who die of this most violent of, of, of its violence every year. Yeah, take care. It is against this form of violence that Freire angrily and compassionately wrote Pedagogy of the Depressed. In fact, I honestly believe that Pedagogy of the Depressed would have not have been written without Freire's class dislocation and the experience of his hunger. And that's the point I'm making. Freire wouldn't have given a shit. He would have been an intellectual stuck in academia, just like everybody else, pretending to be an intellectual, actually being an intellectual, but being, you know, something of a capitalist pig being paid by neoliberals and then spouting, you know, things that make him money. And you know what? Look, you know what this comes back down to? I'm just going to say it again. I, it doesn't need to be overly complex. Live an authentic life. You know, live an authentic life. Be who you are and allow other people to be authentic and allow them to live the way they are. Allow them to progress, to change, to morph. Uh, and as long as it doesn't, infringe on life liberty and happiness you know then they're fine and if we can pull that out the problem is that's not what's happening we don't live that way what if everybody did it right it's all about what can we get away with how much more money can i make at this can i can i sneak a, a higher profit if i don't produce this book for the internet as well as on paper you know it's it's i don't know uh, the reading, the reading and rereading of Freire's insights after I visited his humble home in Moro de Saude, the Saudi, yeah, I don't know how to say that. Both his denunciation of, and de of dehumanization conditions and his announcement that change is difficult but possible unleashed in me a complex of emotions wrought with the reconfirmation of a tremendous loss of his death, a loss infused with anguish, doubt, expectation, and sadness. At the same time, with each new publication of Freire's unpublished work and publication about his theories regarding the liberation of women and men. Quote, we can celebrate, enjoy Freire's return as he, over and over again, energizes and challenges us to imagine a world that is less cruel, more just, and more democratic. And can we please get the fucking electoral college and the senatorial uh, biases out? Um, however, as Freire so energetically insisted in his writings, the announcement of a more just and humane world must always be preceded by the denunciation of the dominant forces that generate, inform, and shape discrimination, human misery, and dehumanization. Hence, the denunciation of oppressive societal forces cannot be done through mere instructional methodologies that anesthetize and domesticate the mind, through banal information transformation that Freire termed as, quote, banking education. I can't wait to read about that. I've heard about that before. Good night, Trullo. Oh, you're staying. Uh, yet Freire's condemnation of mere methods continues to be misappropriated and distorted. There is deep irony in some academic academics' efforts to interrogate whether Freire's methods work and to apologetically provide examples of, of Freirean schools that do work, as Howard Gardner did in a panel discussion on Freire with Noam Chomsky and Bruna de, de, la, de la Chiesa, which took place at Harvard in May 2013. As part of an Ask with Forum, thus vulgarizing Freire's intellectual contributions with, with his major theories. You know what? This is another thing I'm, gonna, I'm sick and tired of hearing. Why do I have to hear about Chomsky all the time? Why do I have to hear about these intellectuals whose opinions matter more than anybody else? Anyone within the sound of my voice, your opinion matters just as much as theirs, provided you've read enough. 
provided you've you've sought out enough learning. Why is it that we have to have rubber stamp like certain opinions and they're the only ones who get to talk? They're the only ones who get to write books. They're the only ones who get to participate in forums. It's fucked up. It always has been. There there are brilliant, wonderful, amazing people and 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 they do not exist in any form of an ivory tower. And I find it ironic that the person who's writing this introduction, you know, was slamming the the what do you call it? I don't know the pseudo you know educators um, who who do the, the neoliberals, and who and then he goes on to cite them, you know, and and it's like it's, what we need is we it's not just look it's not just you know common people. What, thank God we have the internet, you know, and I think it's the democratization of opinions and ideas, and unfortunately that means that we're going to get a lot of shit with it. We're going to get uninformed propagandists it's again it comes back to the, the hunger games i watched the whole series just this week again and it comes back to propagandist versus you know people exchanging information uh, uh well right i mean there's look i'm not i'm not attacking him there's many things about him that i really like um but i i'm sick and tired of hearing about him i want to hear about peter jansen's ideas do you know what i'm saying i want to hear what you have to say if what you've read about, what what are your insights? And thank God we live in a time when the democratization of ideas is 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 overly rampant. It's the downside of this this dream of of you know free expression, which is now being controlled by privacy management. Unfortunately, if we could get that out of the way and have free flowing exchange of ideas and knowledge, we would maybe be closer to what we need to do you know that there's people that have ideas that aren't me that aren't you that are that are not expressing them i mean have you ever met somebody like this you go to the pub and you meet like a genius at the pub i mean you know like a the the the, gen, the word genius has been messed with but you know somebody who has extraordinary insight and you know they they do it on the side you know it's just something they do as a hobby they write about it maybe they share about it maybe they tweet about it maybe they make a youtube about it this is one of the reasons that I am such a fan of Wisecrack. Because Wisecrack is a bunch of people who come together now. They're kind of got, you know, other motivators as well. They got to put food on the table. But this is the this is the manifestation of you know people taking back and God help us if if you know the YouTube algorithms and stuff like that start deciding what we get to see. All right. Um I'm about ready to go to bed myself. Um Okay, so he says, uh, did a panel discussion with Furry and Chomsky as a part of, of, of Ashworth Forum that vulgarized, that this vulgarizing Furry's intellectual contributions and, and his major theories, uh, introduced Furry's leading theoretical and philosophical ideas to a method in such an overt manner as to demonstrate the Gardner's uh, touted theory of, quote, multiple intelligence. Oh, he's the one who did that? I was, I, I missed it. I did, I, I, oh, I read this book and I totally forgot that that came from Gardner. Yeah, Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which is has been debunked and brought forward again lots of times, is susceptible to narrow mindedness, particularly when Freire theories are dismissed as irrelevant, uh, dismissal clearly shaped uh, uh, and controlled by ideology. Therefore, um, I definitely genius creating something which other people cannot create. So if it takes a brilliant novel, a wonderful song, yes. That's genius. Um, my my stepson uh, with Asperger's informed me that the word genius comes from uh, what you are particularly good at and were born to do. And, and so people were geniuses of music or geniuses of gardening or genius. That that's what it, that's where the term originally originated. Um, I could, I, therefore, the demand posed by Gardner to Noam Chomsky, Renaud de la Cia, de la Ciesa, and the forum's audience to provide concrete examples which demonstrate that Freire's method itself works, hides more than it elucidates. I don't really follow that, but... The real question uh, regarding Freire's ideas in theology and pedagogy of the press is whether it is correct to view Freire's literacy proposals as mere instructional methods, as Chomsky responded to Gardner during the forum, According to Chomsky, Freire used literacy as a means to of consciousness raising. Simply put, Chomsky 
was urging educators in general uh, and critical educators in particular to move beyond the fetishization of methods that so paralyze thinking, innovation, creativity among North American educators. Completely agree. Completely agree with that. Uh, throw out introductions. I, I, I've never been told that, but I, I, I find this interesting, so I'm reading it anyway. <laughs> I just say, where, who taught you that? Am I, did I miss the memo? <laughs> I'm supposed to throw out the introduction. Um, I actually really like that little thing that he brought to, to bear there. Uh, I mean, in the intro, the, the discussion of, of where Freire lived, I guess I could have done it all on my own without reading introduction, but that was useful to me, you know. They gave me they gave me some background on where he came from. Um, so somebody put nod nod to Dead Poets Society. Oh right, <laughs> oh, now I get it. <laughs> Rip it out. R I'm not hearing enough ripping of Mister Pritchard. <laughs> Be gone. Big gone. <laughs> it's such a great show. You're going to make me watch that, aren't you? That'll be balling my eyes out by the end of the night again. This is the thing. Dead Poet Society is, I have a feeling, has a lot of this to get. Because he, he broke. The reason it's so fun to watch that movie is he basically just thumbs his nose at all the pedagogies and methodologies. And that's what they're talking about, in, literally in this paragraph right here. Chomsky was urging educators in general and critical educators in particular to move beyond fetish, fetishization of methods that so paralyze thinking. You have to follow this method or this method. Innovation and creativity among North American educators, a phenomenon insightfully analyzed by Lilia. Ooh, I got to read this. A uh, phenomenon insightfully analyzed by Lilia I. Bartolome in her classic article, Beyond the Methods Fetish Toward a Humanizing Pedagogy, published by the Harvard Educational Review. Huh. That's something I want to read. I love be being able to pick and choose what I want to read in my education. You know, there's some there's some uh, higher education um, institutions that will allow you to, like, make your own course and pick up your own link, your own things. And I, I that's a step in the right direction, I think. Anyway... Uh, boy, I could go do this all night. How much time is it? Man, I've already been reading for an hour. Yeah, this is this is a pretty long introduction. Um, you know, what I'll do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna keep reading this, and I'm just gonna, um, myself, and I'm just gonna go ahead and underline it. It's an old school paper book, um, and uh, I'll bring up some of these points when I when I when I come to talk to them again. You know, if if I can't talk about these kind of things, and I don't really, I'm not really interested in doing any kind of live streaming. It's very selfish. I won't lie, um, but but it it uh, brings me a lot of joy to know that there are at least a few other people out there thinking about these things, um, and and it it uh, makes me want to try harder. And you know, that's uh, if there's anything that I need right now, it's trying harder. <laughs> Don't get mad, get busy. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and close off here. Let's read a book and not violate any IP issues. Oh, that's why I'm stopping, Rudin. That's why I'm stopping. Um, if I were to read, I, this is just me reading a couple of couple of paragraphs here and there. That's totally allowed by all the all the standards. Uh, if I were to like do an audio book, yeah, that would be not okay, right? But yeah, if you want to read this with me, uh, I'm going to be reading the finishing up the introduction. Um, I might have to put off my uh, my introduction to Linux uh, walkthrough, which I, I'm going to do Linux Foundation. I'm going through that. I have that up here queued up to do. Um, I probably will do that tomorrow uh, and make a video about that. I do want to slowly work through this and provide some summary to this as part of my beginner education um, track. Uh, I'm just I'm following the Linux Foundation. Uh, I think that at least a few percentage of people think and care about these things. You know, yeah, they do, they do, and uh, and uh, it it just makes it makes me tamer, you know. So yeah, you, should, you might want to watch this Bill and Ted video. It's really funny. Uh, it actually talks about how Bill and Ted is is a possible. Uh, it's actually really amazing. It makes you watch the whole show much differently. That it's actually a commentary on the nature of education and oh god no <laughs> pay for an edX course no way no way this is free this is a this is a free course you only pay if you take if you get the certificate and they have several courses of that type 
Um, and I want to go through it more, mostly because I want to see how good it is. So far, I think it's going to be a little light on the stuff that I would teach. Um, uh, but I'll be I'll be talking about this uh, in in its own video. Um, and I only have until January, whatever, to go through it. It's January twentieth, so I have to finish it by then. And I I intend to do the whole course online, and I've got permission to do that. Uh, it's it's released under Creative Commons despite edX's license, copyright license uh, warning. Uh, I no, yeah. You want to link to the Bill and Ted video? Yeah, here we go. Uh, share. And uh, maybe I'll go watch Bill and Ted. Maybe that. Maybe that's what I'll do. <laughs> People who come here for Go programming or whatever, are like this guy, this dude is all over the place. I'm like absolutely, <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. I just that's just who I am. And uh, and I uh, it's Sunday. So, yes, I get stuff done. It takes me a lot longer. Um, but uh, I'm here for the company as much as I am for the code. Uh, I'm rather opinionated on Linux. I want to criticize some of the content. Yeah, me too. And, and that's why I go through it. The reason that I feel like I need to build an knowledge net is so people can have opinions. Opinions are good, people. Opinions are good. Well-informed opinions are good. Strong opinions are good. Easily weakly held so that you'll change them. Uh, like, thou shalt not use a bunch of gaming. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Windows uh, gamer too, if I do that. In fact, I've, I've decided to allow myself December to play to play, to play play video games. So you may see me actually stream um, some, some video games. Can you believe that? I haven't done that yet. Besides, you know, Space Invaders on a terminal or something. Yeah, I might, yeah, I might actually... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to probably do some Witcher in December. I've been talking about it for a year since last December. Arch for gaming. Wow. Impressive. Impressive. Yeah, I'll be doing using Windows for gaming. You can scream all you want at me. I don't care. Windows is the best gaming system, period. Um it's some sturdy lights. Don't be opinionated. No, that's yeah, too much with bringing. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean if I can get any other Linux to to run it enough, I would be happy to do that. I might try it actually. Uh, Hikari Knight's been trying to get me to do that too. But yeah, so let me just wrap up this thing with 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 Paulo and uh, encourage you guys to to read it if you're interested in education. I I you, you, I, I I won't lie. Some of it is is sort of uh, I'm going to use a weird word here uh, that academics love to use masturbatory. Uh, it does feel like I'm stroking my own ego reading it, saying, "Hey, look at how right I was." Um, but I'm also reading it to, you know, to get new insights and to open my horizons and things. But, but I find myself like really, really like, you know, guessing everything Freire has to say about education because, because, because the traditional forms of education have failed us overwhelmingly. And, and Sir Ken Robbins, and we'll read him probably to some point. I'll read, I'll read, um, he, he died last year. It was really sad. Um, we'll read, uh, out of their minds and we'll talk about that. Uh, shader caching, yes. It games well on Linux. Awesome. Awesome. Oh wow, yeah. If you can run it properly. Yeah, I I I I I uh I'm 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 ashamed of my interest in gaming. Pretty much just whip Witcher until Cyberpunk comes out and uh Overwatch. I love Overwatch. I will not lie. I really love it. I haven't played it in a long I haven't played it in over a year. But uh, I used to play with my kids all the time, and so I kind of associated with them. Speaking of which, I'm going to sign off and go see what they're doing. They're too old to talk to their daddy uh, that much. They got stuff going on, but but that's fine. <laughs> I know I know they're safe and happy, doing great things. Post graduation for me, peace. Take care. Yeah, I know because you'll be like falling off the map there. Is that does anybody know what the date is on that one that's coming off? They keep pushing it out. I was wondering if anybody heard the the most recent date. Yep. Take care. To you after I upgraded. Yeah. Soon. Soon. <laughs> They've been saying that for two years. <sighs> yeah. Considering what they're writing in there, right? I was thinking about them. I was. I've been reading. I've been. He, I've been reading uh, Snow Crash. If you guys want a fun book, you guys know about Snow Crash. This this needs to be made into a movie. I tell you what. If we want a modern action movie with a, with a, and I'm going to say it with a black protagonist, which I think we need more of, um, 
He's not even black. He's yeah, dude. Why why has Snow Crash not been made into a movie? I mean, there's it is it is one of the most amazing movies that could ever be made. Uh, it, this top five science fiction books, Snow Crash. I knew he would like it. Uh, XT does not cut it for Cyberpunk. Oh crap! Ray tracing, crap. I'm probably going to be dead. You're saying my computer's not going to do it? Damn it! I thought I had a good enough one. We'll see. Uh, snow crash. Look at these snow crashes. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, it's so funny. Yeah, I read it a year ago. And I'm gonna. There's the Stevenson. Seventies. I hated seventies. I did. I could not make it through it. I really hated it. Um. Apparently, I've heard everybody all like Bill Gates. Everybody loves seventies. I just do not like it. Uh, other science fiction. I am too kind of a nerd, but I like I like. All of them. This is a fantastic book, though. I just, I wish that this book was made into a movie. It would be such a good movie. Anyway, Brooks and Brews. What the heck? What's this? Men's Journal. Catch it up with legendary. It's like a Neil Stevenson thing. I can't play it or they're going to ban me or something. Wow. We have to go look at this. Novels haven't been made. In oh, <gasps> he's talking about it. Crap. All right, well, I can't play that. I'm going to go play it right now. Bye.